At nearly half past 11 a.m. on January 31st, 1957, above the sky in Pacoima, a suburb in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, California, a Douglas DC-7B, operated by Douglas Aircraft Company, was involved in a mid-air collision with the United States Air Force Northrop F-89 Scorpion. How did they wind up there? On what was to be the last functional test flight of the brand new airliner before it was to be delivered to Continental Airlines, a crew of four boarded the four-engine Douglas DC-7B aircraft with an identifying name of N8. 210H as it departed Santa Monica Municipal Airport. Co-pilot for that very test flight was veteran flyer Archie R. Twitchell, 50, who enjoyed a secondary career as an actor between flying jobs and appeared in over 70 films, including I Wanted Wings, Among the Living, Out of the Past, and Sunset Boulevard, among many others. That same morning, about 65 miles away in Palmdale, a U.S. Air Force Northrop F-89 Scorpion jet fighter with an identifying name of 52-1870, took off on a similar test flight, one that involved a check of its onboard radar equipment. Both aircraft were performing their individual tests at an altitude of 25,000 feet in clear skies over the San Fernando Valley when a high-speed, near-head-on mid-air collision occurred. The radar man aboard the twin-engine Scorpion, Curtis Adams, was able to safely bail out of the stricken fighter jet and despite incurring serious burns by means of a parachute, managed to land on the roof of a garage in Burbank, breaking his leg upon impact. But the pilot, Roland Owen, died when the aircraft plummeted in flames into Latuna Canyon in the Verdugo Mountains. The DC-7B pilot, William Carr, 36, struggled to control the plane as it went into a dive in its final spin. Co-pilot Archie R. Twitchell transmitted the last radio message from the crippled plane. Uncontrollable, uncontrollable. Mid-air collision. We're going in. We've had it, boys. I told you we should have had shoots. A brief silence. Then... Say goodbye to everybody. Now that crash in and of itself was tragic, but to add insult to injury, more casualties would come. The DC-7B, with a portion of its left wing sheared off, rained debris onto the neighborhoods below. And while it managed to remain airborne for a few minutes, it rolled to the left and began an uncontrolled high-velocity dive earthward over Pacoima. Seconds later, the hurtling wreckage slammed into the grounds of the Pacoima Congregational Church and the adjacent playground of Pacoima Junior High School, killing all four Douglas crewmen. On the school playground, where some 220 boys were just ending their outdoor athletics activities, two students, Ronnie Brand, 13, and Robert Zalen, 12, were struck and killed by wreckage from the crashing airliner. A third gravely injured student, Evan Elsner, 12, died two days later in a local hospital. An estimated 74 more students on the school playground suffered injuries ranging from minor to critical. The remains of Carr, Twitchell, and the other crew members, radio operator Roy Nakazawa, 28, and flight engineer Waldo B. Adams, 42, both of Los Angeles, were found in the fuselage, which smacked into the ground at Pacoima Congregational Church, adjacent to the school. Outrage over the deaths led to the construction of a hospital in Pacoima and a ban on military operations over the valley. No memorial was ever built on the school grounds to remember the students. As fate would have it, one student was absent that day. 15-year-old Richard Valenzuela, having taken the day off to attend his grandfather's funeral. However, losing friends and seeing countless others injured led to nightmares and a fear of flying for the rest of his life. The two years of it that he had left were banner years for him, as he blew the music scene away with hit after hit, including this week's topic, his 1959 cover of Robert and Johnny's We Belong Together. Hello, and welcome on back to Hurting in a Love Song, the show where we take a trip to the past to look into the history of a love song we all know and love. My name is Richard Hunt, and this week, in part one of a three-part special, we'll be taking a look into the lives of three musicians snuffed out in their prime. In a special I'm calling... The day, the music up first is Richie Valens. Hi, everybody. This is Richie Valens. We start our story on May 13, 1941 in Pacoima, Los Angeles. That is where and when we meet up with Jose Esteban Valenzuela and Concepcion Concha 
Reyes, two Mexican-Americans who were posted up at the Los Angeles County Osteopathic Hospital, awaiting the birth of their baby boy, Richard Stephen Valenzuela, younger brother to Bob and future older brother to Mario. He would also have two younger sisters, Connie and Irma. Brought up here in traditional Mexican mariachi music, as well as flamenco guitar and jump blues, by the age of five he expressed an interest in making music of his own, and he was encouraged by his father to take up guitar and trumpet, and later on down the line, he taught himself how to play the drums. Surrounded by his relatives who would gather on weekends and sing songs, Richie was greatly influenced by folk songs and melodies of his cultural heritage. His parents separated when he was a child, and so he lived with his father until he passed from diabetes-related complications in 1951. Afterwards, he lived with his mother and siblings, but occasionally they stayed with other relatives who introduced him to more traditional Mexican music. He was also quite taken by cowboy songs by the likes of Roy Rogers and Gene Autry. One day, a neighbor came across Richie trying to play a guitar that only had two strings. He restrung the instrument and taught Richie some chords. And while Richie was left-handed, left-handed guitars weren't really a thing that were easily accessible. But since he was so eager to learn the guitar, he mastered the traditionally right-handed version of the instrument. By the time he was attending Pacoima Junior High School, he would bring his guitar everywhere he went, singing and playing songs to his friends on the bleachers. It was also while attending school that he was exposed to R&B music, with a big appreciation for Little Richard, and rock and roll, particularly rockabilly. As Richie's days at Pacoima Junior High School were drawing to a close, his career picked up speed and had no signs of slowing down. At this point, he was known for performing frequently at dance parties, car clubs, and at the American Legion Hall. Some of the parties were to benefit programs sponsored by his mother to help make ends meet. Other dances were sponsored and promoted by the Silhouettes, a band formed by William Jones and Gilbert Rocha. Originally a quintet, the Silhouettes featured a piano, drums, vibraphone, saxophone, and valens on guitar, and their repertoire consisted almost exclusively of rock and roll songs, but with the group also performing music with a Latin flavor for weddings around the area. It was actually at a Silhouette's performance that he met his high school sweetheart, Donna Ludwig. It wouldn't be long until Richie took over as lead singer of the Silhouettes, a move that would change his life completely. Insert Bob Keane, owner of Delphi Records. Bob worked with, or would work with, many major players, including Sam Cooke, Chan Romero, Little Caesar and the Romans, Ron Holden, Johnny Crawford, Brenda Holloway, Frank Zappa, The Surfaris, The Lively Ones, and a young Barry White. Bob had the mindset of an open-door policy, in which anybody with music they wanted to be released could approach the Delphi offices and get it played. In an interview, he remarked, I'll listen to anyone, even if they bring him in on a stretcher. So having that policy, when he was given a tip in May 1958 by San Fernando High School student Doug Machia about a young performer from Pacoima by the name of Richard Valenzuela, who the kids referred to as the Little Richard of San Fernando, he took it seriously. Swayed by the Little Richard comparison, Keen went to see Valenzuela play a Saturday morning matinee at a movie theater in San Fernando. Impressed by the performance, he invited Richie to audition at his home in the Silver Lake area of Los Angeles, where he had a small recording studio in his basement consisting of an early stereo recorder, a two-track Ampex 6012 portable, and a pair of Newman U47 condenser microphones as his recording equipment. After his first audition, Keen signed Richie on the spot on May 27, 1958. At this point, the musician took the name Richie with a T because, as Keen said, there were a bunch of Richies around at the time, and I wanted it to be different. Similarly, Keen recommended shortening his surname to Valens from Valenzuela in order to widen his appeal beyond any obvious ethnic group. Bob Kane brought Richie to Gold Star Studios. For 34 years, the studio was the venue for hundreds of chart-topping recordings by scores of leading pop and rock artists including Eddie Cochran, The Chipmunks, Brian Wilson, Sonny and Cher, Buffalo Springfield, Jimi Hendrix, Neil Young, The Ronettes, Dick Dale, The Righteous Brothers, Iron Butterfly, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, Jan and Dean, Dr. John, Dick and Dee Dee, Joan Jett, Sherry Curry, Meatloaf, The Champs, Kim Fowley, The Sun Rays, The Baja Marimba Band, Bobby Darren, The Who, The Monkees, The Go-Go's, The Ramones, Art Garfunkel, Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, Tina Turner, Maurice Gibb, John Lennon, and Phil Spector. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! And for a mini fun fact, singer-songwriter Johnette Napolitano, co-founder of Concrete Blonde, was the studio's receptionist in the early 1980s. They entered the studio with a full band backing him. The musicians included Renee Hall, who would work with Sam Cooke, Larry Williams, and Marvin Gaye, Carol Kay, who worked with the Beach Boys, the Righteous Brothers, the Crystals, and Nancy Sinatra, and Earl Palmer, who worked with Little Richard, Frank Sinatra, 
Fats Domino, and Tom Waits. The first songs recorded at Gold Star Studios at a single studio session one afternoon in late July 1958 were Come On, Let's Go, an original credited to Valens slash Kun, Kane's real last name. And Framed. Lieber and Stoller tune. You may remember Lieber and Stoller from the Leader of the Pack episode, and if you don't, check it out. Link below. Preston released within days of the recording session, the record was a success. Billboard cited Valen's first release, Come On Let's Go, as Pick of the Week for September 1st, 1958. And during that same month, Valen's made an 11 city tour of the East Coast. When everything settled down, he returned to the studio to record a song he wrote for his high school sweetheart, Donna Ludwig, simply titled Donna. For the flip side of the record, he chose a song called La Bamba. A traditional Huapengo song from the Veracruz region of eastern Mexico. A Huapengo is a Mexican song consisting of nonsense verses, the meaning of the lyrics often known only to the composer. Valens was reportedly reluctant to record the song, fearing its lyrics would not catch on with American record buyers. It was sung entirely in Spanish and featured some quick guitar work as well as the slapping sound of the relatively new electric bass. In Valens' version, the lyrics featured a drunken sailor insisting that he could dance to the La Bamba better than anyone else. In October 1958, the single Donna slash La Bamba was issued. Contrary to popular belief, it is actually the ballad Donna that was the bigger hit, reaching number two on the Billboard chart. La Bamba, the B-side, only reached number 22, but has proved to be the more remembered song. He eventually overcame his fear enough to travel by airplane for the benefit of his career. He went to Philadelphia to appear on Dick Clark's American Bandstand on October 6th, where he sang Come On Let's Go, which had just reached number 42 on the charts. With his East Coast tour completed, he returned to Southern California, where he spent the rest of October into November, performing in various locations including Disneyland, El Monte, and Long Beach. With three hit songs in less than six months, Valens appeared on the Alan Freed Christmas Jubilee of Stars in December of 1958. He got to perform with some of those who have greatly influenced his music, including Chuck Berry, the Everly Brothers, Dwayne Eddy, Eddie Cochran, and Jackie Wilson. And it was there that Freed also asked Valens to make his singing appearance of Ooh, My Head in his rock and roll movie, Go Johnny Go. On December 27th, Valens returned to American Bandstand, this time to give a performance of Donna. He then signed up for the Winter Dance Party, a tour of the Midwest with Buddy Holly and the Crickets, the Big Bopper, and Dion on the Belmonts for January and February of 1959. The Winter Dance Party series would be Valens' first national tour. Symbolizing his success, the teenager put down a $1,000 down payment on a house for his family in Pacoima. Before leaving on the Winter Dance Party tour, Valens entered the Gold Star Studio for the final recording date in early January of 1959. With his first album, Richie Valens, slated for release in February of 1959, Valens joined the concert tour as it kicked off in Milwaukee on January 23rd. The Winter Dance Party tour would prove to be disastrous, but that's a story for a little later. One of the few songs recorded by Richie in the January 1959 session was his cover of the Robert and Johnny song, We Belong Together. Robert Carr and Johnny Mitchell, who hailed from the Bronx, New York, were a rarity for the 1950s doo-wop scene, as they were a group that consisted of only two members. In 1959, they collaborated with High Weiss to create We Belong Together. You're my The track established the duo as Rock and Roll Immortals, reaching number 12 on the Billboard R&B charts and number 32 on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1958. Robert and Johnny, alas, were fated to be one-hit wonders and ended their recording career in 1962. We Belong Together comes in at 107 beats per minute. Now, I will wax poetic on Richie himself during the last part of this three-part special, but for right now, I just really want to appreciate his ability to take a song and make it completely his own. I mean, he was only 17, but he carried his cover of We Belong Together. In a song that isn't even two minutes long, you could tell the love that he had for Donna. 
It is why the song is so relatable. We have all had a love that was meant for all eternity. And that, in and of itself, is a beautiful thought. This week's Love Homework is another song about your one and only, You and Me, by Penny and the Quarters. As long as there is you and me. Oh, 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 oh. Nobody, baby, but you and I will be saving the biopic choice for the final part of this three-part series. And that's it, the end of another love song history lesson. If you like what you learned, and you'd like to continue learning, subscribe, hit the bell, drop a like below, and join me again next week for the history of a love song we all know and love. Until next time, remember to listen to your gut when a fear overtakes you. And remember, you heard it in a love song. You sure about this? I want everyone to know who I love. How much is this again? 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. Very funny. Next time, use the Visa check card instead of cash or checks. It'll get you in, out, and on with life.